Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us here this morning on Ask the Agronomist. Sorry to be a minute or two late uh, logging on here this morning. I'm, I'm breaking in a new producer this morning. So uh, Dan Shaw, teammate of mine, is uh, is filling in for uh, Adam, who fills in for Jennifer, who fills in for whoever. So uh, we're, uh, we're, we're kind of learning as we go here this morning on Ask the Agronomist. Having some connection difficulties. Uh, sometimes uh, bare firewall, bare equipment doesn't play nice with uh, different internet sites. They, you know, they, they they wonder what we're doing on those internet sites. So, so sometimes it's uh, it's a challenge to uh, get connected, get things uh, get things set up. So, anyway, happy to be with you here this morning. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about the conditions of the crop and what we're seeing in the crop. We're getting close enough to harvest that uh, you can kind of tell. You know, should you be excited? Should you be nervous? Should you be concerned? And people are all over the board on on that subject. So, so there are places where when you walk into that field, it looks just as beautiful inside as it does outside, and you are really excited for uh, what this fall could bring your way. Uh, there are places where you walk into the field and you think, man, how can it look so good from the road and look so mediocre standing out here in this field? So. We're going to talk about what's going on there. We're going to talk about tar spot. We're going to talk about fungicides. We're going to talk about corn rootworm, other insect issues. Um, D Dan needs to use my iPad this morning so he can monitor in the chat. So I won't be able to show pictures today, uh, which is something we've been trying to do more of here lately. I did have some nice pictures of, of stink bug feeding on, on corn and, and some uh, tar spot pictures I was going to show. But, um, but we'll, we'll get by without those this morning. As always, um, log in with your Gmail account and uh, ask questions in the chat. Uh, Dan's here to, uh, to take your questions in the chat and make sure that uh, I'm answering your questions because uh, as you all know, uh, answering your questions is, is really why we're here. And uh, so please, uh, please ask what's on your mind. So we'll go ahead and uh, <clears throat> start off with, with kind of a crop condition report. And just based on some conversations, and I and I will preference what I'm going to talk about here with the um, be honest with you, and I'll, I'll I'll tell you a little secret about a life as an agronomist. Um, between meetings, trainings, conversations with people, doing things like we're doing right here today, uh, you, you might think as an agronomist for DeKalb that I I live in cornfields and soybean fields all summer long, and I know everything that's going on out there. And uh, while that would be nice, uh, it's actually not true. So, so in a in a role like mine, um, it, it can actually become hard to find time to just be in fields. And uh, and I and I need to be in more fields over the next few weeks. So, I uh, <clears throat> I've been in enough fields to to be dangerous uh, with the things I'm going to talk about here this morning, but. Um, I'm planning on spending a lot of this afternoon getting into more fields and, and kind of getting a better pulse for what's going on out there. Because uh, based on the conversations I'm having and the pictures people are sending me, uh, there are a fair number of acres out there that probably are not living up to someone's lofty expectations. Now, that does not mean the crop is bad, but if you think everything's going to make 260, um, you might be disappointed. Now, there, there are areas uh, as you go north and as you go south that have gotten more rain, and, and I think there will be a lot of phenomenal corn. Uh, I was in a field of irrigated corn in Logan County uh, earlier in the week that's probably 300-ish bushel corn. Um, so I, I think there's some crop out there that is uh, that's going to be pretty exciting when we get into it. But if you... Uh, you know, if you, if you look back at your climate, um, what uh, historical weather data, uh, and you got an inch in June and an inch and a half in July, and you've had eight tenths so far in August, you know, o over that three month stretch, uh, you, you've received about 25% of normal rainfall amount. And I, I don't care how green and how pretty it is. If you've only had 25% of normal rainfall amounts through the months of June, July, and August, um, you know, it's not going to be all that exciting uh, when you get out in the cornfield. So let's uh, let's talk about a few things that we're seeing. So I've had questions about row number. I've had questions about ear length. 
I've had questions about ear uniformity. I've had questions about pollination. I've had questions about tip back, which is also known as fernal abortion. And I've had questions about kernel depth. And, and everybody who's been asking me a question about one of these things has been disappointed in it. That's why they're asking me about it. So row number, I got people saying there's not enough. Ear length, they're saying it's too short. Ear uniformity, too many runs. Pollination, missing kernels. Tip back, too much. Kernel depth, shallow. So, so basically the, 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 the complaint in all these conversations that I've had has been related to one or more of these things. So the, the, the corn plant will tell you a lot about what it has been through just looking at the ear. So <clears throat> I forgot one. Ear count. So, <clears throat> so ear count is going to relate to population. It also relates to uniformity of emergence and stand establishment. And ear count kind of relates a little bit to ear uniformity. So <clears throat> it, in, in a lot of our corn acres, uh, stands are good. Now, there were some planting date windows, so May 2nd was kind of a rough day. Uh, there were a few days where we had some fairly marginal stands. We had a little bit of replanting. You might have kept the stand that was 26, 27,000. You know, if you had 26 or 27,000 come up, and there was probably a few of those that almost barely came up, um, you know, you might be walking in some fields that you've only got 24,000 ears. So, so that, that's an issue that, you know, we know what caused that. We, we didn't get a great stand established at the, at the get-go. <clears throat> if you've got a uniformity situation, so let's say you've got 36,000 ears, which is great, but there's only 30,000 good ones, and the other 6,000 are, say, half an ear. So, so those smaller ears were either a late emerging plant, a plant that got some seedling blight in it and was a, a sick plant that got set back. And you know, once it gets set back, it's not gonna catch up. Or a plant that for whatever reason had a harder life um, than the plants that have a good ear. Now those half ears, I mean, they still count, but they only count for half an ear, right? So, so you're, <clears throat> you're losing yield potential <clears throat> with those smaller, run of your ears. <clears throat> row number, when, when is row number set? Row number is set very early in the season. So, so by V5, which would be about yay tall, that plant has already determined how many rows it's going to put on an ear. And typically, genetically, hybrids will vary from 14 to 20. And, and that's just the genetic variation. So if you've got a girthy eared hybrid, you're gonna be up here more towards the 20 end. If you've got a slender eared hybrid, you're gonna be more towards the 14 end. <clears throat> Every hybrid has what we call an average row number. And that's, if it's, if everything's typical and normal, this hybrid's gonna average 16. This hybrid's gonna average 18. This hybrid's gonna average 14. <clears throat> that's based on the genetics. That's in the seed guide. Every seed company can tell you what is normal for this hybrid. I, I had a call from a grower, <coughs> excuse me, that's planting uh, 6618. Big fan of 6618. I am as well. Uh, he was out in his 6618 about a week ago, and he's finding primarily 14 row ears. And so I get a text from him at like 8 o'clock on a Sunday night saying, hey, is, is 14 row ears normal for 6618? And 
unfortunately, I had to give this gentleman some bad news and say, no, that's not normal for that hybrid. Normal for that hybrid is 18. So when you've got a hybrid that genetically is 18 around on average, and you're finding 14s, that means that something early in the season, when that plant was pretty small, did not set right with that corn plant. It was, you know, he said it came up good. He says, look good all year. Well, it, it may have looked good, but it didn't feel good in that V3, V4, V5 growth stage. And so it wasn't feeling terribly ambitious. And so it sat a 14 row ear instead of an 18 row ear. <clears throat> now, typically, if you've got fewer rows, you'll get more length. You'll have less tip back. You'll have bigger kernels. And you can absolutely raise the same bushels on a 14 row ear that you can on an 18 row ear. So you don't need to panic if your hybrid has less rows around than it normally does. But what that tells you is, you know, whether it was not finding enough nitrogen, not finding enough fertility, too cold, too wet, I, you know, it's hard to say what it was that had that thing feeling a little bit off early in the growing season. Now, if we go to row ear, ear length next, so length is determined after girth. So after it is determined the rows around, it's going to determine how long that ear is going to be. That's also genetically influenced. So ears that are slender tend to be longer. Ears that are shorter and fatter, like me, tend to be shorter, obviously girthier. So <clears throat> that is also genetically influenced, but it's probably more environmentally influenced. That's all right, Dan. Got my, got my rookie producer. I forgot to tell him to have his sound turned down. Oh, wait a minute while well, he's finding the volume setting. Let's go to your speaker, Dan. Just on the laptop. Here. I'll be back on screen in a minute. There you go. Slide that over. You're good. <clears throat> Okay, so, so we were talking about row length. So row ear length is determined after girth and from about, you know, it starts fairly soon after girth is determined. So probably somewhere around V8 or so, so maybe close to waist high corn, that's when row or ear length is going to start to be determined. <clears throat> and that's going to go until a couple weeks before pollinate, before tassel. So it takes longer for the plant to determine how long the ear is going to be than it does for it to determine how girthy is the ear going to be. So <clears throat> if you've got, let's, I'm going to draw, I'm going to draw an ear picture here. So bear with me. I'm using lots of, using lots of pictures today. <clears throat> so if, if you've got an ear corn, And the rows running this way. If you've got no pollination on the tip, you've just got bare cob here. That means that you had a pollination issue. Could have been beetles, could have been missed the nick, could have been tough conditions. We're not sure what. If you've got a board of kernels out here on the tip, that was not a pollination issue. Pollination happened just fine. The kernel died after it was pollinated because the plant didn't have enough resources to keep that kernel going. <clears throat> if the grain on the ear is 36 long, you had pretty good growing conditions when that plant was determining how long it was going to make that ear. If, if the whole ear itself, even counting the part that's tipped back or not filled, could have only been like 28 to 32 long, 
you, you've got a really short cob, basically. And what that will tell you is that that plant, before pollination, before tasseling, during that ear length determination phase, was really stressed. So if you've got short ears because of... Okay, cool. So Dan doesn't need my iPad anymore, so I can use some pictures. Okay, so if that ear is short because the cob is short, that tells you that that plant was under quite a bit of stress in May and June. And we had a lot of areas where it was really dry in May and June. And if you're going to lose yield from being too dry in May and June, the way you're going to lose yield is it's going to shorten your ear size up. Lack of nitrogen, other nutrient issues can do that as well. <clears throat> if you got a nice big long cob, but you just don't have enough grain on it because of tip back or because there's a barren tip at the end, that is not uh, an ear length issue. That is either a pollination issue where we just didn't get the kernels pollinated or you got it pollinated and then they died or aborted after pollination. And those are two, you know, that, that tells you a lot about what was going on as well. If, <clears throat> if it didn't pollinate, that had to be an issue with silks or pollen or the timing of the silks and the pollen. If it pollinated and then aborted, which is more common, the tip back that we talk about, what that tells you is that plant set more kernels during pollination than it could support during grain fill. That's normal. <clears throat> that's fine. And honestly, I like to see some tip back. If you don't see any tip back at all, what you know then is you had really good conditions during grain fill and you didn't have enough population to maximize yield. Because if, if you see some tip back, that tells you that you're getting everything out of that field that you could. <clears throat> Those ears that, you know, the kernels are pushing themselves off the tip of the cob and you don't see any tip back and they're filled out clear to the end, they look really nice sitting on the coffee table. They look really nice on the counter at the grain elevator, but those aren't the kind of ears I like to see because that's a field that I know left some potential on the table because we didn't have enough plants out there to maximize yield. So you want to see some tip back. Now, you don't necessarily want to see three or four inches of tip back. That just means you've had a tremendous amount of stress in that field and you're losing a lot of yield potential because of that stress. But anytime you see tip back, you, you know this. You got everything Mother Nature was going to allow you to get out of that field of corn. So, <clears throat> so tip back is a good thing. You know, it's nice if you can see about an inch of tip back, because what that tells you is <clears throat> you didn't waste a whole lot of money on seed that you didn't need, but yet you got full yield. If you see three or four inches of tip back, you know, we probably could have planted a lot lower population, saved some money on seed and achieved the same yield because mother nature didn't allow us to achieve a, a super great yield. <clears throat> so we touched on ear uniformity. We touched on row number. We touched on row length. Let's talk about pollination. So, <clears throat> so I've had probably, probably the most frequent call we've had and talking with some of my colleagues, a lot of people are getting this call. It's not related to hybrid. It seems to be fairly widespread. There are just a lot of ears out there that are missing some kernels. And they're not necessarily missing kernels, just, just on the tip. So, <clears throat> so going back to our ear again here. If you're missing kernels at the tip because of tip back, that's normal. If you're missing one here, there, and everywhere on the ear, that's probably related to either silk clipping from insects or the other thing that can cause that is long silks and delayed pollination. And if you get a really whole bunch of silks coming out the end of an ear and they get really long and your pollen's falling down from up here, this little guy down here that's covered up and he might go back to a spot on the ear right there that silk that was covered up by those long silks, if no pollen grain ever falls on him, that kernel never gets fertilized and you end up with a hole there 
where there should have been a kernel. <clears throat> now, what I will say is most of the ears I've seen, that missing kernel, it, it pollinated, but then it aborted. So, so you can have a missing kernel anywhere on the ear due to lack of pollination, which is just going to be bare cob hole right in that spot where there should have been a kernel, or it maybe it pollinated, maybe the last kernel on the ear to pollinate was this guy right here. <clears throat> because of a beetle clipping situation or covered up silks, or maybe he was just unlucky, don't know why. But if that kernel right there is the youngest kernel on the ear, pollination is supposed to start at the butt and finish at the tip. So if things happen like normal, your old kernels are at the bottom, your youngest kernels are at the top. That plant is going to abort kernels in the opposite order that they set. So <clears throat> first one to set is the last one to abort. The last one to set is the first one to abort. Typically we get tip back because the youngest kernels are all at the tip. If for any reason, the youngest kernel on this ear is right here. He'll be the first one to go when, when kernel abortion starts. So tip back at the tip is what we're used to seeing, but you can have kernel abortion anywhere on the ear if pollination was a little bit funky and you had some kernels anywhere on the ear that were younger than the kernels at the tip. That's what I've seen more of than kernels that didn't pollinate. End result's the same. You're, you're missing a few kernels on the ear. Now what happens is in the real world, <clears throat> if you're missing a kernel here, this one, 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 around the one that's missing are all gonna be bigger. <clears throat> they will get so big that they often will grow into that open space there. <clears throat> And they'll do a pretty good job compensating in yield for the kernel that's missing. <clears throat> the other thing I say about these scattered random kernels missing on the ear, if you've got some tip back on that ear and you've got random scattered missing kernels, nothing really changed. So if, so let's say there's 10 kernels scattered across the ear that are missing plus an inch of tip back. If these 10 kernels were there, there'd be 10 fewer up here. So every plant can only produce so much dry matter. So based on the number of kernels, the size of the kernels and the weight of the kernels is gonna determine how much dry matter is on that ear. So <clears throat> if, if you can grow, let's say if you could grow, uh, how many of you have heard about half pound ears? Half pound ears is a good thing to shoot for. That's kind of an old rule of thumb, probably doesn't apply anymore. But but let's say you can produce a half a pound of dry matter on an ear. If you've got one kernel that weighs half a pound, big ass kernel, or you've got 500 kernels that weigh half a pound, or you got a thousand kernels that weigh half a pound, or you got a hundred kernels that weigh half a pound, it's still a half a pound, right? So that plant can only produce so much dry matter. So, so this is why sometimes kernel number doesn't matter as much as, as you think, because the more kernels you've got on an ear, the smaller they're going to be. So that's why when we're doing our, our yield calculations, if, if you've got a really girthy ear that's long, so let's say you got a 20 by 40, you know, 20 by 40 would be a monster ear. You know, if you got 36,000 20 by 40s with <clears throat> any kernel depth whatsoever, uh, you're going to win the NCGA yield contest. But typically what happens if you've got a 20 by 40, you're going to have itty bitty little kernels versus some of these 14 by 32s that guys are looking at going, oh man, you know, I thought my crop was going to be really awesome. And I got 14 by 32s out there and that's like embarrassingly small. <clears throat> but if you've got really big kernels on a 14 by 32 ear, 
you can raise the same amount of grain as you can on a 20 by 40 if you've got the kernel depth and the kernel size. Now, if you're telling me that, well, my row number's down, my ear length's down, and my kernel depth looks pretty shallow, well, that, that's kind of a bad day because you, you, if the kernels are small and there's not very many of them, you know, then, then we're, we're going to have a hard time coming up with the, with the yield that you want to see. Hence the different seed size. Yes. So, so Dan just, Dan just made the comment, hence the different seed size. So, so there are, <clears throat> all this happens in seed fields too. So I, I know all of you that have a seed size preference really get frustrated with us at times that we can't always give you your seed size and weight preference. So when we're growing this stuff in the field, um, the better it pollinates and the less it yields, the smaller the seed's going to be. The poorer it pollinates, the bigger the seed's going to be. So, so when somebody comes to you with a hybrid and says, yeah, I, I got the hybrid you want, but it's 64 pound rounds and that's all I can find. What that tells you is the seed field that produced that grain probably didn't have the greatest pollination in the world. You had scattered pollination. You got a bunch of big seeds growing on here because there weren't very many of them. If somebody comes to you with a hybrid and says, well, you know, I tried to find you what you wanted, but what I got here is 29 pound flats. You know, that, that tells you that probably came from an ear that pollinated really, really well. And there was a lot of kernels packed on that ear, so they didn't get very big. You know, we're trying to use defol and other technologies to control the size of the seed. So if we've got a field that we know, we can tell the seed size is going to get huge on, we'll actually kill that seed field prematurely to control, hopefully, the size of the seed to try to get it closer to the, the bag weight and seed size that you guys are, are looking for. So good point, Dan. Dan's getting more comfortable in his producer role. He's starting to interject into the program. So that's nice. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> so we talked about kernel abortion. We talked about tip back. Um, you know, again, kernel abortion is, is normal. Um, it's, it's healthy. It, you should see some. We don't want to see too much. But again, if you don't see any, that means we didn't have enough plants. And that field would have yielded more if we would have planted it thicker. So that, that brings up another topic. I was just having this conversation today. So let's draw our corn plant here. <clears throat> There's your main ear. What if you've got a second ear? So you got your primary ear. And you got your second ear. Sometimes some, sometimes seed companies get, get made fun of because... Uh, you, you, you guys think that uh, we're, we're intentionally breeding hybrids to only set one ear because we want to sell you more seed and we ought to breed hybrids that are prolific eared and have three or four ears on them and then you wouldn't have to buy as much seed. My guess is if we did that, the seed would cost a lot more, but that's just a speculation on, on my part. Do you know the primary reason why corn was bred to have one main ear? So. Let's go back a few hundred years when it was all done by hand. And if you were going out to harvest your field and back then it was all open pollinated corn and you were actually saving ears from the plants you liked to replant next year on your farm to grow that crop. Let's say you had a plant there that had 10 ears on it and they were all itty bitty little nubbins. And you had one next to it that had two nice big ears on it. Which one would you save seed from to plant back the next year? You want the one where you got to pick 10 little puny ears to get the same amount of grain as this one that you only had to pick two nice ears off of? No, you'd rather have the ones that's got the two nice ears. So over time, you know, way back when, we started selecting for genetics that had one primary ear because you're going to harvest by hand. You want to pick one monster ear or 10 little ones. Pretty easy decision. You want the one big one, right? So, so that's, that's when we started selecting for, for single-eared hybrids. Now, all hybrids can set multiple ears. Some hybrids, so if you want to know what, what hybrid I think in the DeKalb lineup is most likely to set multiple ears, it's 6253. 
hybrid that I like. It's a great stress hybrid. It's a great hybrid for lighter soil. Dan sells a lot of it in his area. Um, you know, that hybrid, I, I've seen it on the end of fields where you give it some extra room with six ears on it. And four of them are actually pretty good ears. And all six of them had some grain on it. Now, not every hybrid will do that. It's not the highest yielding hybrid we sell by any stretch of imagination, but it is a very good stress hybrid. And it will, if it's thin, set multiple ears. <clears throat> but does the, the question I get is, does the second ear rob from the first ear? And is that plant actually hurting itself by having that second ear? I'm going to tell you it's not. Now, you would be better off to have more plants and one ear because the plant, the leaves, that's the factory. So you want as many factories as you can have on an acre feeding those ears. So if you've got one plant with two ears, you've got one factory that's feeding both of those ears. If you've got two plants with one ear piece, you've got two factories feeding two ears, and you're going to end up with more yield typically from that. And you're going to end up with enough more yield to more than offset the extra cost of the seed to plant the field a little thicker so that you only have one ear on plant. But let's say the field's thin, <clears throat> let's say it's a hybrid like 6253, which, which will fairly easily set a second ear. And let's say this primary ear is a 16 by 34, and the second ear is a 12 by 24. So the second ear is never going to be impressive, but I mean, it's got kernels on it. But this ear's got tip back. And this ear's got tip back. So the fact that our primary ears got tipped back leads some people to think that, well, the, well, the secondary ear robbed from it. So, so again, that, it doesn't really work that way. But remember I told you that the last kernel to pollinate is the first one to abort. So in some cases, a butt kernel on the second ear is actually older than a tip kernel on the primary ear if pollination is occurring normally. So, so after pollination has occurred, and this plant's sitting here with, let's say it pollinated a thousand kernels. That's pretty common. You're never gonna have a thousand kernels on an ear, but it's pretty common for a corn plant to, to fertilize a thousand ovules. That's the fancy scientific term for kernel. So, <clears throat> so let's say it pollinated a thousand kernels, but it can only feed 600. So unfortunately, 400 of these are going to get aborted. And normally, you know, 100 of those are going to be here and about 300 of them is going to be on this ear. So that second ear is typically going to abort almost all the kernels off the second ear. But you can end up with two ears that, that both have grain. Um, those two ears added together. So let's say this, this field's at 25,000. These two ears added together, maybe they got 750 kernels. But if you'd had 32,000 ears with 580 kernels on them, that's probably going to get you more bushels. So that's why we can't lower population, put more ears on a stalk of corn, and make you more bushels at the end of the year. But it's also why... The, the second ear, be, be glad that it's there because if you've got a field that's got a second ear on it, what that means is that plant with the main ear couldn't maximize its yield potential with one ear. So it did what it could to set more than one ear. So this field is going to yield more because that second ear is there. But it would yield more yet if we had a higher population and there weren't any second ears. But it's, it's not that the second ear is hurting that plant. It's that more plants will out yield a second ear, if that makes sense. I think everybody's pretty quiet this morning, Dan. Any questions coming in on the chat? Not yet. Yeah, I think everybody's out busy working. Okay, so let's get down here to the last one. This is the one that's going on right now. So kernel depth. So kernel depth is 
is determined somewhat by everything that's happened before. So, <clears throat> so if you've got really high kernel count, it's going to be hard to have super, super deep kernels because you got a lot of them to fill. So kernel number will affect kernel depth because they, they're, they're related. But in general, what's affecting kernel depth is whether during grain fill, which is exactly where we're at right now. So, so what we want for grain fill is we want a healthy plant, which we'll check that box because most of our plants are pretty healthy. We want ample moisture. And that's sort of depends on where you're at. And if we can get it, we would like to have cool nights. So <clears throat> we've got healthy plants. We're going to talk about disease here in a minute, but the plant health is, is generally good. Some places have had ample moisture, some places have not. And we haven't been, it hasn't necessarily been a hot summer, but it hasn't been a cool summer either. We're in a bit of a cool stretch here right now. But here over this past weekend, we had two nights where it was, it was 80 all night. Um, that's really hard on grain fill. Now, now two nights of 80 all night is not as bad as a week of 80 all night, but the places that raise really, really, really good corn, like Washington state, believe it or not, Colorado, it's all irrigated. Of course, they have a lot of days where it's about 86 and sunny. And then every night it's about 55. And, and if you want the perfect conditions for grain fill, you want moderate, bright, sunny day, cool night, plenty of moisture, healthy plant. So if that's what you've had, that, that's good. If you're finding a lot of shallow kernels, then you didn't have enough of the environment that, that we just described. So <clears throat> it, it, I can't tell you what the right yield factor is going to be for you. So, so yield factors, we've talked about this before. Your yield standard yield formula assumes 90,000 kernels per bushel or per 50, so 50,000 kernels to make 56 pounds of grain. <clears throat> it could be 85, could be 80, could be 75, could be 70. There, when, when things are really good, it's less than 70,000 kernels to make a bushel. And, and that's when you get some really, really, really exciting yields. <clears throat> when things are really bad, we had some of this last year, it might take 95, sometimes it can even take 100,000 kernels to make 56 pounds. And we won't do the math here for you this morning, but you can do the math at home. <clears throat> Plug in, so let's say you've got ear size that's Let's just say we're pretty average. We're 16 by 32. That's, that's about as average as you can get. And let's say you got 34,000 16 by 32s. So if you figure up how many kernels you've got per acre and then divide by these different factors and see how crazy your yield swings. So, so if you just want to do that, I'll, I'll, hell, I'll do it. Could have had Dan doing this. So, so let's say we take our six. I've done 90,000. Okay, so what's 90, Dan? 193. 193 bushel. Okay, so if you're looking at 34,000 16 by 32s with an average of 90,000 kernels per bushel, you're looking at a respectable 193 bushel yield. Not exciting, but let's let's see what happens if you have a good kernel or uh, grain fill. So give me an 80, Dan. We may fire Adam. Dan's doing really good at this producer job. 217. 217. Okay, that's moving in the right direction. Just for just for fun, do a 70. Probably gonna go up about 245 bushel. Okay. So if you have this ear size, this ear number. And these three factors, 
That's how much that impacts your yield. So there's uh, 48 and 7, 50, 55 bushel spread between here and here. So when you went out last year and came up with your 250 yield check in early August, and then you pulled into your 187 bushel corn in October. This is why. The kernel number didn't change. The year number count didn't change. But what changed was the size of the kernel. And the size of the kernel, actually it's the weight of the kernel. I could open the can of worms of test weight. I'm not going to do it. Yeah, Dan says don't go there. <clears throat> He's seen me argue with people before on that. It's not pretty. So, so that kernel weight is changing based on the conditions you had during grain fill. So the same thing is going on in soybean fields. It's even harder to see the impact of seed fill on soybeans. You know, generally speaking, if we're seeing lots of pods, it's easy to find a four bean pod. You don't see pods laying all over the ground. You don't see... A, a soybean pod that went from, so you can see there's one, two, three, four in that pod. It didn't abort down to a three, or you didn't have a three that aborted to a two, or you didn't have a two that aborted to a one, or you didn't have the whole pod abort. You know, that that's about all we can tell on soybeans, and it's, it's really hard to gauge. You know, it's hard to gauge the yield of corn. <clears throat> Some would say it's impossible to gauge the yield of soybeans. It's not impossible, but it's difficult and it's a lot of work and it's a big pain in the ass. So I, I, I like to check my yield and soybeans with the combine is how I like to check my yield and soybeans. So that, I'm glad you brought that up. You might talk about this. I was in the field uh, looking at some disease uh, starting up in beans last week and uh, the grower had a field uh, that was planted first of April mm -hmm. uh, testing out his new planter. Mm -hmm. 40 acres. He just Planted them, 140,000. Yep. Uh, then get back to planting the 40 right next to it at the end of April. Mm -hmm. We done a pod cow. There's 24 different, 24 more pods on the early April Woo. versus the late April okay. and had more four bean pods yeah. on it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, so, so Dan's comment was he was with a producer that had a, a pretty significant difference in planting date had done some really early beans, checking out a new planter, just getting stuff set. Uh, and, and they were finding just on average, just counting some random plants, <clears throat> 24 more pods per plant on the early planted beans than on the later planted beans. And they felt they were seeing more four bean pods on the early planted beans. So if you've actually got more pods and more seeds per pod, you know, that's given you a lot of additional yield potential on those early planted soybeans. Now, it, it, it's just, just like corn, that soybean plant can only feed so much grain. So <clears throat> you can have situations where you've got fewer pods, fewer seeds, but they're bigger and, and that can help compensate for the yield. <clears throat> but generally speaking, the number one way to increase your yield in soybeans is not by putting more seeds in the pod. We had fun with that five bean pod thing uh, several years ago, and that was cool, but that's not how you increase yield in soybeans. <clears throat> Making the seed bigger is not how you increase yield in soybeans. How you increase yield in soybeans is getting more pods on the plant. And <clears throat> one more pod on a plant will add a bushel, a little more typically to your yield depending on your seeding rate, your population, <clears throat> somewhere between one to two bushel, just from one more three bean pod on a plant. <clears throat> now <clears throat> that, you know, makes it sound like, oh, it's easy to increase yield in soybeans. Well, it, it's not, it's, it's not easy to get another two or three pods on a plant, but the difference between ho-hum soybeans and oh wow soybeans is not that many pods. So if we can get a few more pods on every plant, you know, that, that's how we're going to get those soybean yields that we're, we're looking for. Okay, so let's, uh, let's talk about tar spot a little bit. I don't want to, I don't want to not talk about it. So <clears throat> the crop is really, bear, bear with me here while I pull up some pictures. 
the crop condition visually is outstanding. Um, I haven't found any southern rust yet. It's hard to find even common rust. You can find gray leaf spot. Matter of fact, the tar spot pictures I'm going to show you are actually better gray leaf spot pictures than they are tar spot pictures. <clears throat> so, so this would be, I try to get the glare off of it. That's a corn leaf. Uh, my, co my colleague, Chris Callaw, sent me that. That's from Southern Sangamon County. So Southern Sangamon County is not necessarily known for being the tar spot capital of the world. But so far in Chris's territory, that's where he's seen the worst tar spot. I'm going to pull up another picture here from the same field. That This one looks a little more serious. So that's tar spot. Now the rectangular brown lesions, that's gray leaf spot. Both of them are killing leaf tissue on that plant. But this plant, especially this leaf here, you see all the yellow areas surrounding the black spots? That's a leaf that is going to fairly quickly be dead. And if you've got leaves that look like that at the ear and especially above, and your corn is more than two or three weeks away from black layer, that's a field that we would probably recommend getting another fungicide application on. Now, I think there were a lot of people that were loaded for bear on tar spot this year. And a lot of people that were prepared to make two applications of fungicide after tassel. Thankfully, in most cases, I don't think that's going to be necessary this year. There's a lot of trials going out and I've got a ton of fungicide trials on my own farm. Dan probably does too on his. So I've got a field and this is going to be kind of fun to harvest. We put down eight ounces, 10 ounces, no, yes, and 12 ounces of Delaro Complete at VT. So this would be DC stands for Delaro Complete, VT. It was probably honestly more like, more like R1. Didn't quite get it done when I wanted to, but that's another story. <clears throat> and then three weeks later, we came back crossways in this strip here with another eight ounces, again, of Delaro Complete. And this field had four ounces of Delaro at V6-ish. <clears throat> I've also got some trials on that. The rows are planted this way. So every pass through the field with the combine, you know, going in field view, I'm going to be going in and out of that double sprayed strip. And I've done this on about 12 different cornfields and probably eight different hybrids. And there's a lot of other people doing the same thing. So, so we're going to have a lot of trials out this year. Uh, we were joking about this yesterday. You know, <clears throat> we were going to learn a lot about tar spot this year. And we did all the stuff this year that we should have done last year. And there's not much tar spot around compared to last year. Now there's still tar spot. There's, there's little spots where it's, it's, it's nowhere that I'm aware of. Is it anywhere near as bad as it was last year? But you know, those pictures that Chris sent me, that's enough tar spot. Our colleague, Jim Donnelly, Jim Donnelly's probably knows more about tar spot than, than anybody I know personally. Uh, he has lived with it since tar, you know, he was one of the first people to identify tar spot in the state of Illinois in way back in 2015. <clears throat> and so Jim has dealt a lot with tar spot and Jim's got some really good YouTube videos. So Jim and Rachel Willis. So, so the Northern Illinois team, the central Illinois team, Dan, Dan's got to live with, with Cal Al and I, um, you know, and, and we're not really, we're just generic agronomists. The Northern Illinois team, they've got two actually trained pathologists for their agronomists. So they've got some really, they're a little, they're a little disease heavy up there in Northern Illinois with, with their tech support people. So Jim and Rachel actually just put out a, a good video on YouTube. If you, if you look for it, I'm sure you can find it with a tar spot update from Northern Illinois. But the interesting thing we've seen 
And I think we we should be able to put these pieces of the puzzle together later in the season uh, when we kind of see how things shake out. But what, what Jim has observed in the past, and we think we're observing this again this year, it was hard to see last year because the tar spot was just everywhere and it was pretty heavy everywhere. But this year we've got pockets where it's showing up bad here. You can't even find it over here. I've got plots at Monmouth, and I, and I would have said that Monmouth had reasonably good weather for tar spot development this year. I've got unsprayed plots at Monmouth, no fungicide at all. You can't find any tar spot in them. Now, now before the season's over, there's going to be tar spot in those plots. It's later planted corn. It's got a long way to go. <clears throat> so, so there will be tar spot there, but there's none yet. And they haven't even been sprayed. And then that picture I showed you, that corn had been sprayed. Now, it would be a lot worse if it hadn't been sprayed, but the environment that that corn's growing in is a lot better for tar spot than places where we're not seeing it. And what Jim has observed and the pattern that we're looking for, so if you've got an area where you're finding tar spot and you're scratching your head going, well, why have I got tar spot here? Look back at your weather in, I'm going to say late May through the middle part of June and see how much moisture you had. See if you had any big rain events. See if you had any frequent rain events. See if the areas, see if you can find a time, a period of time on the calendar where the areas where you're seeing tar spot had more rainfall, more moisture, more humidity than the places where you don't see it. We think that we need the right weather conditions to stimulate infection earlier in the growing season, pr prior to tassel, to get it kicked off, get it going. Once you get it kicked off and get it going, it can keep going with less than ideal weather conditions. But you need some good wet, you need some good tar spot weather to get it started. And in areas where it was just bone dry through May and early June, and there were a lot of parts of Illinois that were that way, uh, people were, were really worried we were going to lose the crop prior to pollination because it was just so dry. Now, a lot of those areas have had buku rainfall since late June. Um, that has, you know, saved the yield potential of the crop. And we've been worried that, oh, we've had, I mean, we've had perfect conditions for tar spot here lately. A lot of heavy dews, a lot of cool days, um, you know, a lot of moisture, but yet we're not seeing a lot of tar spot. And that may be because we didn't have the right conditions at the right time earlier in the growing season to get it started. Now, the, the, the picture I showed you a while ago, <clears throat> that's already got a good start. And so that stuff's going to keep going, keep spreading, going to get worse. But it, but it's got to get started before it can get bad. Once it gets started, it can easily get bad. But if it hasn't gotten started in your field yet, or it's it's really super hard to find. I mean, if you got to crawl around on your hands and knees and look at the bottom leaves to try to find a speck or two that might be tar spot, you're in a good spot there because a lot of this corn is within 30 days of black layer, even if you didn't plant super early. And if you did plant early, you're closer to black layer than that. You know, if you're within 30 days of black layer and you really have a hard time finding anything, you're even confident is tar spot in your field. That's a good day because it's going to get worse by harvest time. You're going to be able to see it pretty easily in that field, but it's probably going to be like what you saw in 2019 and 2020. It was there at harvest. You didn't even really notice it prior to harvest those years. Um, it was there. It was concerning. It got people's attention, but it didn't impact yield. And, and I hope in a lot of cases, that's what we're dealing with this year as well. But uh, there are places where there are some second applications being made. There probably are a few fields. You know, it, it, it might relate back to um, the timing and the quality of the application, maybe the rate, maybe the product you chose. Did it get fungicide? Did it not? But probably primarily it's going to relate back to what was the weather at that site early in the growing season. So I, I like to use my climate field view for that. So you could any field you've got in climate, you can go back historically, you know, even, even if the field wasn't in climate all season long, if you put it in there today, by tomorrow, all of the historical weather data that happened to that field will be in there. 
And you can go back and you can look at the daily rainfall amounts and you can look at how many days it rained and you can look at you know, how much rainfall has that field received during the growing season? How much did it get since planting? How much did it get in May? How much did it get in June? If we think late May to mid June is maybe the time that tar spot gets gets kicked off and going, you can look at how much rainfall did it get during during that window. And so just look back at that weather history where you're seeing more tar spot and see if you can find a, a correlation in the weather that, that kind of fits, kind of makes sense. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. There's a lot of variables out there, um, but, but that's one thing we're going to want to watch pretty closely. So one thing I also seen a lot last year, yes, we had some tar spot, probably the most ever we've had in mm -hmm. my territory, but crown rock. Yes. Roots. Yep. What are you seeing this year, Lance? Right. So so Dan brings up a good a good point. So we, we get wrapped around the axle on tar spot. So last year we had three primary corn diseases. We had tar spot, we had southern rust, and we had crown rot. And, and I would say if I rank them in importance and how much they impacted yield, and I, I'll have people throw stones at me here because everybody's just so spun up about tar spot, but I'm going to say one, two, three would be the order in which they impacted yield. Now, the main thing we observed is if you had a healthy amount of all three, that was the really bad stuff. That was the corn that was making... 140 when somebody else's corn was making 240. These were the fields that had all three of those diseases that I think we could have added 100 bushel of yield with a V6 followed by VT followed by R3 fungicide program. Now nobody did that last year so we didn't really get a chance to test that. We got a lot of people doing that this year and we're still not going to get a chance to test it because we don't have last year's disease pressure. But to answer Dan's question, how much crown rot are we seeing? Crown rot is the hardest disease to, to scout for because you got to dig up the roots, you got to split the stalk. <clears throat> so far, it appears that we're seeing a lot less crown rot than we did last year. I don't think we had the, the a lot of the corn didn't go through the cold, wet conditions this spring that it did last spring. So I think we got less crown rot in the root system. But the other thing that really made crown rot so bad last year was it interacts with the foliar diseases. So any stress on the plant. So the number one stress that usually brings crown rot on is drought stress during grain fill. So if you have a really stressful grain fill period, you're going to see more crown rot. The infection is already in the roots. You just get the right stressful conditions to make it blow up and, and take out the plant. But if you've got a lot of tar spot, a lot of gray leaf spot, a lot of southern rust, maybe a little bit of northern corn leaf blight, if you've got all these foliar diseases chipping away at your factory, reducing the photosynthetic capacity of that corn plant while it's going through grain fill, which is very stressful, and it's dry and hot, that is the perfect scenario for crown rot. And if there is crown rot in that root system, it is going to absolutely blow up in that plant and it's going to smoke that plant prior to black layer. And it's just going to go from when, when your cornfield, and we'll start to see this any, you know, I would say fairly soon, we'll start seeing these plants. We see them every year. I call them ghosted plants. I've already seen them. So Dan says he's already seen some. So a ghosted plant goes from green and beautiful to kind of a off green to kind of silver to brown in about four days. So, so you're out there Monday looking at that green field and it's just beautiful. By Friday, you got, so here's a, you're looking at the field from the road. That's how we do our scouting, right? So here's all your green plants. And this one all of a sudden is completely brown and the ears drooped over. But the rest of them are all green. And then this one dies and ear droops over. 
if you dig up those two plants and split the stalk down through the crown of the roots, you're going to find that it's completely rotten in that crown. And, and that's, that's what crown rot's doing too. These are the ghosted plants that we talk about. And these plants are going to have shallow kernels. And just not a lot of yield protect production. You're going to get probably 50% or less yield out of these individual plants. Now, if it's 1% of the plants in your field, no big deal. If it's 50% of the plants in your field, which it was last year in some cases, you know, that's when we really get into some pretty significant yield hits. <clears throat> the number one thing we found for suppressing crown rot, it doesn't prevent it. It doesn't prevent the infection, but it helps kind of keep it at bay is a Bt fungicide. So, so crown rot pathogens, we think, infect the root system early in the growing season. So you might say, well, if it's infecting it when it's a little seedling, what the hell good is it going to do to spray fungicide on it when it's tasseling? Well, you're going to really alleviate stress in the plant. You're going to keep the leaves healthier. You're going to protect the plant. You're going to give that plant a, a better life, and that's going to make it <clears throat> more tolerant or more able to fend off that crown rot infection that it's already got in the roots. So we're at time today, and I just realized that I forgot to do my podcast today, so shame on me. Um, <clears throat> but uh, anyway, thank you for joining this morning. If you have questions after you've watched this episode, contact your FSR, contact your dealer, contact me. Uh, we'll be back in two weeks, which, when is two weeks, Dan? Uh, we always tell people what, uh, what two weeks is going to be, and I didn't look that up my calendar here. So that would be the 25th of August. So Thursday, August 25th will be our next episode of, of Ask the Agronomist. Appreciate you being here with us this morning and uh, get out in those fields and, and see what you got. Um, fingers crossed that you're happy with what you see when you get there. If you're not, you know, I think we talked about a lot of things today that might not make you happy, but it will at least help explain um, why the corn maybe doesn't look as good in the field as it does looking at the field from the road. So with that, everybody stay safe and uh, we'll see you again in two weeks. Thanks. That's all there is.